so Mariam Mahaja is a British Iranian BAFTA winning animation director. So she was born in Tehran in Iran, um, lived through revolution, war and immigration. She has a background in painting and discovered animation after moving to the UK in the year 2000. She got her MA in animation from the Royal College of Art and her short films have been screened at loads of international festivals. She lives and works as an animator, writer and director in London. Um, and I'm pretty sure I first met Mariam when I saw her film Grandad Was a Romantic in Edinburgh uh, in June last year. And I just remember like, it was a really full cinema. It was back in the old normal where we could all co go and sit in a space together and watch films. And like the whole cinema just erupted with laughter at this film. It was like so cool to kind of see it get such a good response. Um, so yeah, and then we've been bumping into festivals, bumping into each other at festivals ever since until they stopped in March. <laughs> um, so yeah, really excited that Mariam can join us and talk more about her amazing work and about how she deals with stress. Hi, Mariam. Welcome, Mariam. Please, um, you, you have you take over. I'm going to stop sharing now. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Um, so let me just share my my screen. Um, I, as as you know, I'm Marianne Mohaja. Um, can you see my screen now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and I've been introduced to you as um, a BAFTA winner just now. Um, although I still find it hard to believe, yes, my, my film Grandad Was Romantic did win me a BAFTA. Um, but what I want to talk to you about today uh, begins um, from one of the scariest, most stressful days of my life. Um, about three years ago, um, I was a freelance animator. Um, I, it had been about nine years since I had made my own films. So for nine years, I've only worked on other people's work um, projects. Um, and at this point, I had been working on my new script for, for about two years. Um, and I had applied for funding. And on this day, I realized that my funding application was rejected. Um, these rejections are, are quite um, tricky. Um, these are my, the, the films that I've worked on, uh, my own films, you know, nine years before. Uh, when you get a rejection, for, for me, one of the easiest reactions um, is just to wait and use my creativity in, in other ways. So I did some painting. I have a paint back, painting background, so it's always something I enjoy doing. Um, I also um, published a book in Iran. It's, it's a series of short, funny love stories. It's in Persian, um, uh, but it is something I did, and I, again, I enjoyed doing it. Um, and it's, it's not always, you know, sophisticated, things that you do with your creativity. Uh, just did this thing, I could be a shoe. Um, and also having a kid helps, you know, lots of arts and crafts projects with, with my daughter. Um, and these are um, Halloween decoration uh, using expired flour. Probably gone wrong. Um, so you, you're doing all this and in the meantime, your script, your story, your idea is just sitting there gathering dust. So by the time you get the um, funding, if you get the funding, I never did. Um, I think there is a risk that you, you may not be connected to your story anymore. Um, so I just decided to go ahead and make the film myself and not wait for the fun funding anymore. Um, how am I going to do this? You know, um, th there are two, like two, two ways of panicking, as you say, two stress factors, really. One was from the practical 
point of view and one was from the emotional mental point of view uh, from the practical point of view is it was that i had no team not even a producer i was on my own um so on, on that note i thought okay i'm a 2d animator i've got a computer and uh, a lot of it I could do myself. So I, I already had written the, the story, i have done the script. Um, so I became my own producer. I am a director, animator and designer at the same time. Um, there are two things that in my projects, in my films, I would never ever compromise um, and say like, okay, I can do it myself. One is music and the other is sound. Uh, music, uh, I've been working for Tanara Dawkins, the composer, for years now, um, and we have a great relationship. And the moment she said she was on board with this, it really like motivated me even more to do the film. Um, with sound, I had this great experience working with, with um, Sue, Sue Harding, the Foley artist in Phonic, in my graduation film, again, nine years ago. Um, but I really, really wanted to work with them again. Now, we're talking about Phonic. Phonic is a great sound studio working with huge, huge, you know, TV productions, feature film productions. Um, you can't help but think, okay, why would they be even interested in, in this tiny, low-budget project of mine? Um, a good friend once told me, always approach you know if, if it's a famous actor if it's a well-known sound uh, mixer the worst thing they could they say no um so i approached and luckily they didn't say no they, they were up for it um so that was the practical bit done um from the um, emotional point of view um again that it was that i was on my own um i was um you know as i said no team i wasn't a student anymore uh, so i did not have that whole support system the you know the lovely tutors to to just you know to to go to when you need to talk to someone even uh, even the, the thing that i was really craving for uh brainstorming sessions with your fellow students you know when you all sit at the table and you all just talk about your ideas and amazing things happen there um so i didn't even have that uh, but again, the scariest thing for me was that I have not made a film um, in nine years. Um, it, it felt like the universe of animation had moved on into you know, something amazing, whilst I was left behind in a half-asleep phase. Um, am I even relevant today? Um, through kindness of a friend, a good friend, I got the chance to actually um, attend a big anima international animation festival um, as a guest um, and I was there about for about a week and all I did was just watch short animations from around the world. Now it was really inspiring of course but at the same time it kind of took my fear away. You know I was watching these fantastic films thinking hey um, I actually connect with that um, we could belong to the same universe. So I, I can do this. So that was very, very helpful. So that's, you know, I decided to go and make uh, Red Dress No Straps. Now, when, when, I, when you start, I think you definitely need a deadline. Again, not having a producer, not having a client, um, you know, the project could go for, for a lifetime. So I tend to set myself a deadline first. And what I use is um, the submission deadline of a certain festival. Now, if whether any of my films ever got into this festival is another story, but it, it worked really well as, as my deadline. So I've got my deadline set. Um, the next thing is, is your story. Uh, for me, because I, I, I'm a storyteller, because I'm a writer as well, um, the story, uh, to, to come up with the perfect story could, could take up two years, really. Uh, no exaggeration. 
Um, and my story, this one, started from a sewing machine. It's just such a rich subject, uh, the movement of it, the sound of it, the rhythm, and all the memory that it's got, you know, the, the things it's made, who's been using it, who has it been used, who has she or he been using it for. Um, and this one, to be exact, was actually my grandmother's sewing machine. Uh, when you base your story on, on real lifetime memories, it, I think it, it bears a certain uh, weight with it. Uh, for one thing, it's, it's most likely based on people you, you deeply care about. And there's this thing of, okay, I would, do I want the story to work? Do I want to be honest? Or do I want to protect, you know, these people that I care about? Um, and also, um, the, the grandmother that I sort of, that started the story um, had passed away by then. Uh, so going back through our memories, you know, photographs and things, that was quite an emotional uh, journey for me as well. Um, the next thing about this film in particular was uh, war. The film gradually became a war film. film. It, I did not plan it as a war film. I was... I was in the in storyboarding stage actually when it, it turned into a war film. I think we, uh, my generation from Iran, because we lived through war, um, it's almost like a shadow that's just sitting in the corner next to you, wherever you are, and it it literally like just made its own way into my story. I can explain later after you've seen the film because I don't want to you know give give out too much. Um, the next thing after you've sorted, you know, the, the story and the script is, is the look of your film. Okay, you've got all these ideas, you've got all these things to say. How do you visualize it? What should it look like? Um, in, in this case, it took a um, good um, two months for me to come up with the, with the look and say, okay, this is it. That's what I want it to look like. Um, once you get to storyboarding stage, for me, you know, after you've storyboarded the first few shots, that's when you say, okay, you know, you know, I think you've, you've sort of passed the huge milestones and you, you know, the film could go on. Um, now, so I've started the film, um, as, as you know, I'm a parent for four months. Uh, except for school pickups and school drop-offs, I would not meet, greet, talk, interact with any real human beings except for my family. Um, I was spending over 12 hour shifts every day in this room where I am now. Um, no breaks, no weekends, um, no holidays. Um, that Christmas, uh, my daughter and my husband went away to spend the Christmas with, uh, to spend Christmas with, with relatives. Well, I stayed behind uh, working on my film with no one to keep me company except for our little dog. Um, so I, I made it though. I met the deadline. I finished the film in time. Uh, and now what? Um, so I start sending the film to festivals. You spend hours, you know, filling out all these forms and also spending a lot of money for submission fees. Uh, so you, you do that. And then again, what can you do? The weight um, and the stress. So I'm going to keep him there for now, just to, to take care of our stress. Um, with the festival thing, again, you know, with that nine year gap, no one knows my name. You know, no, my name does not ring a bell. I do not belong to a famous animation company, a filmmaking company. Um, I, I, this is not a student film, so I don't have the name of a good university, well-known university behind me. So what are the chances of 
um, festival submission team uh, being interested enough to even watch my film till the end. And if you submit, if your film is on Vimo, if you submit via Vimo, you can actually tell, you can see how much of your film has been watched. And I'm telling you, there are some heartbreaking moments there. Um, so two months goes on, I hear nothing. And in April, I remember I was visiting my parents in Tehran. I was having a cup of tea, black tea with my mom. And I'm sounding like a moody teenager. I was going, this is it. This is the end of my career. I can never be a professional filmmaker. I might as well accept it. And on that same day, I'm not, you know, I'm not making this up. On that same day, I received this email from Edinburgh Film Festival, which Lauren just told you about. Uh, so that was my film premiere. Um, and the, the start of Retro No Straps um, festival journey, uh, which was amazing. I, I got to, and now after COVID, I appreciate it even more. You know, I, I went to so many places, you know, watched so many films and watched people watch my film live, which was amazing. Um, right after, so Retro No Straps was finished February, 2018. Next year, February 2019, I finished Grand Apples Romantic. I think I, it was quite warm and, you know, buzzing from Red Dress, so it, it was quite smooth. And I had my team already on board this time. Um, and the confidence, of course. Um, so, and Grand Ad, as you, as you might know, won me the BAFTA. And now it's been you know, doing its own festival journey. Uh, and I have never looked back again. <sighs> that was my story. <laughs> Thank Amazing. You. Amazing. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariam. Um, I'm pronouncing your name as if it's a Turkish name. Am I saying, because I'm saying Mariam, because we have that. Am I, should I be saying Mariam? No, Mariam. Okay. All right. I just didn't want to keep making the... No, no. the um, lovely. So thank you so much. We're going to show the film first, um, and then um, we will do a little bit of a Q&A. So I think we're all very excited to see the, the red dress um, that's been mentioned. Are you ready? Hope you like it. <laughs> On Monday in school, they told us to say death to America. Grandpa listens to Voice of America every evening. We're at war. We've said them. Yesterday, on Friday, Saddam tried to bomb our house. But he's so rubbish that he missed. Our house was not hit. We're all alive. And we're not dead. <laughs> On Monday in school, they told us to say death to America. This lady is American. She's a singer. She's pretty. 
Her dress is pretty. Really pretty. Granny's making it for me. And I'll wear it. And I'll be the queen of fairies, rabbits, and elephants. The exact same dress. No straps. <laughs> On Tuesday, there was a party. After lunch, all the women came into the bedroom. But how does the baby come out? Still a bit sore. On Wednesday, we went to the jewellery shop to pierce my ears. On Monday in school, they told us to say death to America. My uncle lives in America. He sends pictures. Lots of pictures. He went to America to study, but then there was a revolution here, so he never came back. My uncle's going to be a professor. He does nothing but study. All day. Every day. Granny says so. <laughs> By 
didn't want straps. Granny says I can't wear a strapless dress until my boobies grow bigger. But my boobies will never grow. Do you remember when I said that Sad Dumb was so rubbish? That he missed our house? That we're all alive? That we're not dead? I lied. La 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 very so beautiful and sad <laughs> at the same time I'm sorry i think i saw some tears i'm sorry i do apologize <laughs> um no don't apologize um i want to say what navid said he said he's so proud right now that he's iranian and he's thanking you so um, thank you